If you have your Bibles, please open them to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 10. I want to speak to you tonight about a Christ-worthy life. Christ-worthy life. This is not going to be a simple subject. It's not going to be an easy subject to preach, and it's not going to be an easy subject to understand. So with God's help, let us, as the Scripture says, gird up our minds and get ready to think about what God has to say tonight. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 10. This is what Paul wrote to the believers at Colossae. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord. Now if you're already into this and paying attention right off the bat, your mind has just taken a detour. What in the world? Does walking worthy of the Lord mean? We have a conundrum. We don't understand it. How can I, who is so full of carnality, so full of tendencies that are contrary to God's teachings, how can I, who is flawed and filled with the seeds of failure, how can I walk worthy of the Lord? But this is what Paul is praying, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If you don't understand the first part, the last part should be a desire of yours if you are a believer. You should desire to be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So at least if you can't understand the front half, the second half ought to register to you. That's what I want in my life. And with God's help, we're going to crack the front part and open it up for you that you could understand it. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. Although our minds sometimes have problems grabbing a hold of the concepts and sometimes we just simply cannot understand it or comprehend it. Yet, I thank you that there is a certain life and a hope and a courage that comes with it, even though we may not fully comprehend it. But I pray tonight that by the time we leave this sanctuary, that this verse is crystal clear to us. I pray that you would help us tonight to understand what it is that Paul is praying for, and how we too can walk worthy of the Lord Jesus. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This is part of a prayer that Paul said he has been praying for these Colossian believers. With these believers at Colossae, Paul shares some of the un ambitious prayers that he is praying for them. These requests made by Paul for these early believers are anything but modest in the scope of Christian character. The apostle prays in verse 9 of chapter 1 of Colossae that these believers might be filled with the knowledge of God's will, that they might be filled with wisdom, with spiritual understanding, but he does not end his prayer for them there. But he goes further asking that the believers will walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Verse 10. Oh, what high and holy goals this apostle had for these saints. This prayer literally eclipses our prayers for one another in this modern day. Brothers and sisters, we do not pray prayers this audacious and ambitious for one another today. The content of our prayers are mere vanity up beside this colossal prayer prayed by the apostle in our text. When the most ambitious thing that we dare ask for in today's culture, the most 
ambitious and audacious prayer that we pray on the behalf of another is for healing from some physical ailment. We are clearly underutilizing the privilege of prayer. Oh, that God would give us faith to pray bold and ambitious prayers for one another again. The Scripture and history contain stories of many who prayed bold and ambitious prayers. In contemplating such a thing, one has to think of Abraham and the prayer that he prayed when he negotiated with God over the city of Sodom in Genesis chapter 18. You remember how he stood before God and he pleaded from 50 down to 10, asking God if there was only 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom to not destroy it. We're thinking of bold and audacious prayers. The prayer that Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18 comes to mind. And here in our text we encounter a very bold and ambitious prayer prayed for the believers at Colossae by the Apostle Paul. I pray, said Paul, that you walk worthy of the Lord, Colossians 1 and 2. Now this prayer up beside that one prayed by Abraham when in fact the lives of people were in jeopardy might not at first glance seem quite so bold. Or if you compare this prayer with the prayer that Elijah prayed in the time of national spiritual crisis, this prayer might seem less audacious. But I assure you that this prayer can hold its own up against any prayers ever prayed anywhere by anyone. For this prayer is prayed for the entire person, mind, soul, body, and spirit. The most important prayers ever prayed by anyone at any time in any place is the prayers for the souls of men. Again, pardon me in my lament that so much of our praying today is solely for the bodies of men. Oh, how superficial have we become in our usage of prayer. I believe in praying for healing. I believe in praying for men's bodies and their lives. But so many times we focus on the superficial. We major on the minor in prayer when indeed the most beneficial prayers that we can pray are those prayers prayed for the soul. The reason that I say that this prayer by the Apostle Paul is one of the greatest prayers ever prayed is because it lays out the most perfect request for an ideal believer in Christ. If we could design a model believer, we could use this prayer as a blueprint. Paul prays that the believers would please God in everyday things as it regards their daily lives in verse 10. He prays that these believers will be fruitful in every good work, verse 10. He prays that the believers would increase in their knowledge about God, verse 10. He prays that these believers would be strengthened by the power of God, that they would be patient, that they would be long-suffering and joyful in verse 11. He prays in verse 12 that they would be constantly giving thanks unto God. Now, assuming that these believers were human like you and I, we should have no difficulty in seeing how this prayer is so bold. For basically, this prayer asks that the natural and carnal tendencies of mortal man be done away with and replaced with a better and holier substance. Paul is basically praying that these believers would be changed, that their pettiness would be replaced with piety, that their rashness would be replaced with righteousness, that their futility would be replaced with fertility, that they might walk worthy of the Lord. Now let me ask the question that's been on our minds from the time we read the text. How can one walk worthy of the Lord? How can my life as a believer ever be as precious as the life which our Lord Jesus willingly gave up on the cross? I say that this is a concept 
This is the desired meaning conveyed in the text. When we read the word Lord in our text, we automatically connect it with Christ. The word Lord is a generic term as far as it is used many times, and it can refer to either God or Christ. But in the New Testament, the word Lord is more often than not connected with Jesus Christ himself. And so when we find the word Lord in our text, we automatically understand that Paul is asking and praying that we would walk worthy of Jesus Christ. The meaning of the Greek word that is translated worthy in the KJV means in a manner befitting or deserving of. Paul is saying, I'm praying that you live your life in a manner that befits or is deserving of Jesus Christ. But he goes further because that word also means of equal value. It carries with it the idea that if you was to set on the balances, the life of Jesus and the believer's life, Paul prays that they would balance. They would be of equal value. They would both weigh as much. What a bold and audacious, audacious prayer. Is such a thing possible? Can we as believers live lives that are of comparable value to that which the Lord Jesus led? On the surface, it seems impossible. And yet, why would the apostle pray for something which was virtually impossible? So, let me deal chiefly with two questions in this sermon. First of all, is such a life possible? And secondly, what kind of life is this? Is such a life possible? Many would say that it's an impossibility. An impossibility for the believer to live a life of equal value to that of Jesus Christ. And in the terms of eternal ramifications of Christ's cleansing blood, which he willingly shed on Calvary's cross, I will agree. However... This is not what the apostle had in mind when he prayed this prayer or committed this text to the scroll. What he prayed was, I pray that you will walk worthy of the Lord or that your life as a believer will be one that is befitting or deserving or equal in value to that of Jesus Christ. When you consider how Jesus lived... What Jesus did on the earth in terms of benefit, not miracles, but benefit, that alone leaves us overawed. How can such a life be possible? But I want to present to you John chapter 14 and verse 12. It is the words of Jesus himself. And I want you to consider what it says along with me. Jesus says to his disciples, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works shall he do, because I go to my Father. In light of this verse, I again ask you, is such a life possible? Based upon two facts, I believe that it is. Fact one. I find it impossible that Paul should pray for these believers to accomplish an impossibility. And secondly, I find in the passage of John chapter 14, Jesus praying or saying, the works that I do and greater works shall ye do if you believe on me. We now are not talking, we are talking quality here, but not quantity. Jesus did not say more works or more miracles shall the believer do. But greater works shall ye do. Again, the sacrificial death of Christ is not in play here. It is not being considered here in this argument. Christ did not say this sacrifice and greater sacrifices shall the believer do. No. He is saying works, that which can be accomplished in life. I ask you a question. Did the apostles of our Lord in the course of their lives do greater works of import than did Jesus? Well, first of all, if they didn't, then Jesus 
prophesied something over them that did not come true. Because Jesus said, greater work shall you do because I go to my Father. So if the disciples never accomplished greater works than Christ did, then there was a problem there with what Jesus promised them. So I believe on that alone we could say, yes, the apostles of our Lord did greater works than Jesus did while on this earth. But secondly, I ask you, when you consider that Jesus never in his ministry saw 3,000 people saved from a single sermon he preached, but Peter did on the day of Pentecost, does that not qualify for greater works? When you consider that Jesus never spread his gospel abroad into the Gentile world, he never went outside of the boundaries of Judea. Jericho and Samaria for him was the uttermost parts of the world. That's as far as he went. But when the apostles went all over the known world spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many, many Gentiles were saved, and the Christianity spread across the globe, was that not greater works than Jesus did while on earth? When the apostles stood before kings and before emperors and preached the gospel, was that not greater works? Jesus never did such a thing. On the apostles' labor and their testimony, Christianity spread over the inhabitable world. There is no way to estimate the impact the gospel has had on the world over the centuries or how many souls have been salvaged as a result of the apostles' great work. I say, yes, the apostles did greater works than that that Jesus did. Not minimizing what Jesus did, but he gave that prophecy and I believe they fulfilled it. Now, the second question that I want to consider is the one that I posed alongside of the first one. Is such a life possible? And secondly, what kind of life is this? What kind of life can the believer lead, which is in a manner befitting or deserving of our Lord and of equal value to the life of Christ? What is it? We must understand it. Otherwise, we have no idea what Paul is praying for. It's not a sinless life. That's impossible for the believer. John writes in 1 John 1 and 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. It's not a sinless life. Is it a life of performing miracles? No. For Paul makes clear that the power to work miracles is given to the believer by God as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 9 and 11. In verse 29 of the same chapter, Paul makes it clear that not all believers are workers of miracles. Yes, these signs shall follow them that believe, but not necessarily everybody that believes is going to be workers of miracles. God gives gifts of miracles to some people. So that's not it. Is this kind of life exclusively found in preaching and teaching? No. Not all are preachers. Not all are teachers. Then what is such a life that Paul is praying for? We need this revealed. We are sure that it is an impossible for us to attain. I want to tell you on the authority of Scripture, it is not. Here is the life which the believer can lead, which is worthy of Christ and of equal value to his. It's simple, but it's profound, and it's not easy to accomplish. The life that Paul is praying for, for these believers, is one of a totally sold-out, surrendered life dedicated exclusively to the will and purposes of God. That's the kind of life that Jesus led. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Meaning, he and God were working hand in hand. He was working God's will. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 36, 
The works which the Father hath given me to finish the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. The writer of the Hebrews speaks of the sold-out, surrendered life of Christ in Hebrews 10, 7 when he quotes Psalm 40 and 7, which Psalm 40 and 7 says this, Lo, I come... In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. That is what Jesus came to do, to do the will of God. And he accomplished the will of God. He lived a totally sold out, dedicated, consecrated life. He never once decided to do things his own way. He never took upon himself any part of selfishness or carnality. He lived his life in submission to the will of God. This is what Jesus taught his disciples and what we have in writing spoken by the words of Christ, Matthew 6 and 24. No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. There has to be a selling out point. You have to make a choice. You can't live split personality and live for God. You can't serve the world and serve your interest and serve the flesh and serve God. You're going to have to make a choice. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 24. Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is saying you're going to have to bear some burdens and walk some roads that aren't necessarily pleasant. But if it's the will of God, you have got to sail out to cash in your will and do what God has in mind for you to do. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The man who puts his hand to the plow but still looks back hasn't quite made up his mind yet. Jesus is saying if you're still looking back, you're not living the sold out life. You have to make a choice in your mind. When you grab a hold of this plow, you need to have your mind made up. Don't look back. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Don't long for it. Don't be like the Israelites out in the middle of the wilderness trying to go to where God's trying to take you and dreaming about fish and garlics. Don't be trying to do like Lot's wife, just run far enough to not get your britches singed, but still looking back, hoping that it's not totally destroyed so you can go back. God said you got to make a choice. When you get ready to follow me, I want you to sell out. I don't want you to have anything left to go back to. I don't want you to have any memories left to salivate over. I don't want you longing for anything back there. I want you to be willing to go all the way. You don't have a past, but you certainly have a future. In Luke chapter, or in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 38. Now watch this, because this is in the language of our text. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy. What did Paul pray? I pray that you would live a life worthy. Jesus said, if you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy. We can take the antithesis of that verse, rewind it, 
and stack it up and see that there are some things that makes us or keeps us or prevents us from living lives that are worthy of Christ or that are of equal value to Christ. Jesus did not live for any other reason than to do the will of God. There are no words which we can speak, however anointed or powerful, that can make us worthy of the Lord. I can't preach a message or a thousand messages that will ever make me worthy of the Lord or make my life of equal value. That just won't happen. You can't sing so beautifully and so anointed that your life is of equal value. That doesn't happen. You could give your body to be burned. You could feed the poor. You could speak with the tongues of men and angels, but that will never make your life worthy or of equal value to that of Jesus. The only thing that will make your life worthy or of equal value to the life of Christ is living a sold-out, dedicated life. If we could perform miracles, that would not do it. What did Jesus say will happen in the last day at the time of the end? They will come and they will say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. We have preached and prophesied in your name, and through your name we have cast out devils and did many wonderful works. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. You're not worthy of me. That doesn't do it either. Even martyrdom, even martyrdom alone cannot cause our lives to be worthy or as valuable as was Christ. Only a totally sold out, fully committed, continually surrendered life is that which is worthy of and of the same value as that of Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul argues for in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Listen to what he says. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, not a dying one, but a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This manner of life must be one in which you and I participate voluntarily. Paul says, ye present your bodies, not by constraint. Jesus was not constrained to lead such a life. He did so voluntarily. A living sacrifice, a living one. No martyrdom is necessary to accomplish this. Holy or sanctified, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, not impossible service. And so the question is answered for us, I believe, in the passage. When we consider the factors, is such a life possible? Yes. What is that life? It is a life of total surrender and submission. A life that no longer finds any value in this world and in carnality. A life that is able to say no to myself, but always yes to God. I close with this. When I consider Christ and his worth, when I remember his life here on earth, when I recall the cross that he bore, the shame and the pain the stripes that he wore. When I consider all the apostles, Peter and Paul, how can I give Christ less than my all? 